if it's a foregone conclusion, we won't automatically have it unless we do have a network book idea as part of the future. Kindle is networked. As, as, as far as I know, most of its network features allow you to buy more. Uh, I don't believe it's that social unless there's features that people know about that I don't know about. Um, but there are emerging social book uh, clubs like library thing where interests and titles and libraries uh, are being shared and we're interested in all of that. Sustainable has to do with the materiality of the book and the fact that we can't keep uh, using materials and energy in the same way that we've been doing. We all know this is true. Um, cradle to Cradle is an idea set or a meme that we want to pull from here, the idea we need to close the loop. And it's already done to a large degree with things like newsprint. Uh, it goes back around and gets down cycled, but we can do it in a better way. The physical book, Cradle to Cradle, is actually upcyclable. The material it's made on is not paper. Who, who knows the book, Cradle to Cradle? Um, the book, if you go and check it out at home, you'll remember you can read it in the back. It's made up of polymer or plastic. And if all books were made that way, theoretically, if they perfected it, you could just keep upcycling the material. It's a closed loop of technical nutrients. Scalable is the thing I want to talk about the most. Here's why. Design is about making things that, when they get reproduced, the world is a better place. Um, sometimes when it happens, we get more of a good thing than we want. Cars, for example, are too much of a good thing in the sense that even if we got rid of the fossil fuels, we would still be choked in traffic downtown because everybody's in, a, in their personal transportation vehicle, one person per car or something. So too much of a good thing can be bad. So we need to think forward about scalability and go for the things that we want and keep assessing it. Is this the right thing to scale into the future? Um, so to rephrase our research question, what, I, what I'd like to propose is how can we collectively, all, there's a lot of smart people in the room, they're all working on the problem from different angles. How, and F Lab, Strategic Innovation Lab, is our home. It's a research lab at Ontario College of Art and Design. Our specialty is using strategic foresight and innovation thinking, which we see as a combination of design thinking, business thinking, or organizational thinking, and futures thinking, to create an integrated practice. So we go from thinking to practice to making change in the world. It's about social innovation. It's about more of a good thing. Um, so I want to say that the future of the book that I would like to be part of, we're using the word S book just to give it a handle that you can search or whatever. It is open in the ways that the web is open. There's a question of authority for what in Peter's talk came up as attribution. So authority, attribution, what I would call verifiable traces. And consistency as one of many words we could choose to describe the quality of user experience and the quality of archival persistence and findability. Uh, arch archival persistence, like how in 20 years' time, in the future of, that we're moving into, can we, or 50 years' time, can we move back through and find threads of authorship? And, and it, we don't just get a world of 404 errors, you know what I mean? Uh, link rot, it's called in the web world. Um, any questions so far? I'm almost out of time. So the, the research question is, how can we maintain and enhance openness, authority, consistency in the age of transmedia? And I'm going to just quickly describe this uh, model as a thought tool. It's not the model. There's a hundred million models, but one way to think about it. We have the reader, writer, publisher in the center, in a sense, because flowing from the center out uh, it takes more effort in terms of attention economy and maybe industrial economy like materials and energy to go from the center to the outside. The first thing you create a document, you add references. If you put it into the cloud sphere, the web, you get comments. It turns into its own little network. Then when it's turned into a book, the hyperlinking drops away. That's a shame. We need books that can support links. Uh, as far as I know, a Kindle book doesn't support links. Maybe I'm wrong. You, you can link out to the web from the Kindle book. And then you're surfing on the web from the... Okay, so the step in the right direction. Then from here, the way it works right now, you go from a printed book to an e-book, uh, sometimes, not all the time. But because an e-book is a special uh, category, because it's uh, new, mostly the pre... The, what I'm suggesting is these things might trade places because 
It may be that web books are the easiest thing to create, and then ebooks, which have a level of pagination, and then uh, printed books will become rarer and rarer. I will make the argument that that's true. Because they take materials, energy, they will become more of like a souvenir or a memory or something you want to share or a gift. That's not a bad thing, it's just a choice and it has costs and benefits. So we're moving from industrial economics, scarcity of materials, energy, resources, to attention economics. And what I want to throw out there is, does this model help us think about these goals? Do you agree with these goals? Can we basically keep the print world and the web world the best of both worlds and combine them? That's my question to you. Okay, before calling up Peter, I just want to I forgot one element, the smart part of the smart board, which is that the recommender system built into will be built into the computer that you get to the web page with. And that recommender system will identify those elements in the book, those pages in the book, or those parts of the book where there's information of particular interest to you. So this would be fantastic for researchers looking at nonfiction books because it would identify the things that you're most interested in. And the big payoff would be if there was a whole library of smart books and you could walk into a library and all of a sudden there would be all the books that you need to look at and the pages you need to look at. If the library becomes just a repository for e-books, it's no longer a collection of physical books, but it becomes a place where it's an accession terminal for books that are in the cloud, uh, the recommended system would do the same job. So, now, here you go, our value. Uh, so, I'm just going to take you through one version of an S book. Uh, a very simple version that would be very easy for you to, to uh, see how it would work. Uh, I can introduce myself. My name is Bob Logan. I'm a physics professor at this university but I'm most proud of the fact that I am the chief scientist at the Student Innovation Lab at OCAT. It was not a hard position to get since I'm the only scientist in the place. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's an honor to be embraced by the College of Arts and I want to be my co-conspirator, Greg Vanowski, you uh, probably have heard that he is a designer. Uh, and I'm going to kick off for the first five minutes and then we'll be followed by Greg. And then there's going to be uh, two, three responses, quick responses from Peter Jones, who's working on the project, James Paulwell, who's also working on the project, and Carlos Scarlai, we've already heard from, not very much, uh, who came all the way from big Spain in Catalonia to be here with us, further away than Boston. So, the smart... Well, I call it a smart book, but it's also uh, a social book, it's a <coughs> network, it's scalable, which Greg will explain. It's searchable because you have an e-version, you can search it. It's simple, that means you can, it's easy to read, because there's nothing better than reading ink on paper because of our brain, the way it's organized. We have a left brain and a right brain. Left brain does the reading, the right brain puts together patterns. So when you look at a pixelated screen, like this guy is doing here. You use your right brain to create a visual image of it, and then you use your left brain to read it. So there's a lot of traffic going through the corpus callosum, and I claim it's not as uh, easy to read that as it is on paper. In a session this morning, 25 out of 25 authors claim that they would only edit their book on paper. They'll print it on the computer, but they'll edited it on paper. One person said, <coughs> actually you can catch things in both. You, you can find errors looking at it digitally that you don't see on paper, but also you find things on paper you would never find digitally. So here's how the smart book works. This represents a computer, this represents a book, and this represents a web page. And uh, one way of doing this is you have a two-dimensional barcode on your book. The book is called The Generic Book and it's written by Mary Author. And the camera on your computer hits this little two-dimensional barcode and it sends you to a web page. And on that web page you find an e-version of 
a generic book. But that website, web page or website can also be used for author updates. So I've written a book called Understanding New Media, Extending Marshall McLuhan, which is an update of his book, Understanding Media Extensions of Man. And I'm going to have a website that updates my book because new media are changing so rapidly. Uh, the website can also be a place where readers do their annotations and their comments. <coughs> and they can be shared and archived with other people, so the book becomes network. So it's, uh, or it's, that's the social part. Uh, just to get another asset there, updating I'm calling synchronized. So it's synchronized writing, and synchronized swimming. It's sustainable because if you don't have to print thousands and thousands of copies of the book, you can always use POD, print on demand. And it supports, notice the app, supports active reading. That's the ability to annotate and to share with other people. So that's really the simple idea of uh, my version of the smart book or the S book. And I think that it's a, you know, we don't have to choose, uh, as King Solomon once was confronted with this choice. Right? And he was wise enough to figure out a solution to the problem facing him. So in Solomon Long's fashion, I say, you don't have to choose between the e-book and the printed book. Let's bring them together and find a hybrid solution. I was supposed to talk for five minutes. I think I've done that. Did yeah. I use all five minutes? Yep. Yeah. Well, I'll reserve 30 seconds for later comments. <laughs> Thank you. I designed for serendipity. Do we have it? or are we missing it? And where is the value? Are you seeing value? And if so, where, where could we add some value out of this that we might be missing? We're really, we're interested in filling this in. We don't have the answers yet. We don't have a prototype. We're from, we're from OCAD and we haven't shown you a prototype, right? We're still, <laughs> we're still like on paper. So, right, so there is, this is our prototype and we want you to interact with it. Please think about those questions. I'm now going to call on the people whose hands have been up the order of freedoms, having lived in print culture and having now lived in web culture for a while. Uh, as a designer, my personal answer is I would like to com combine and synthesize those freedoms as we move into the new era because, I'm, because I see books, printed books becoming more expensive, more rare. Libraries don't want to store them. It's very expensive to store. Learner-centric uh, behavior and options is what we want to support. If you look at the way people learn and experience knowledge nowadays, it's both print and the web, but they're like left brain, right brain, or they're, they're split. They're not very interoperable. I'd like to make them more interoperable. Because there's a part of me that my gut instincts almost make me think this is the lowest common denominator. That is something that is adaptable to a book, to a printed book, and an e-book that could go either way, has the limitations of both. Conceivably, <laughs> yeah. and, the and, and the extended benefits of neither. In the last session, we talked about okay, printed books or ebooks are not an either or. There's room in this space for both, and you're not going to have a single format that's going to adapt to everything. So, if you have something that's both a printed book and an ebook, well, what you've described basically has okay, here's a, here's, a, here's a physical volume with a barcode on it. That could just as easily be a credit card with a barcode on it that points to an electronic thing that has your annotations, that has all the benefits that an ebook brings, together with a paper printed manual that isn't updated easily, that doesn't do the annotations, that doesn't have the benefits of these other things. And I'm sort of wondering how are you going to use this? to maximize the benefits of each format rather than making them constrain each other. That's what we wanted to ask you. I mean, yeah. imagine a text. No, I'm asking you. Well, you. Imagine you, Elfon. <laughs> 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 the, the, the human body doesn't change. Number two. High, high quality print <laughs> of, of physical images is great for print media. But the research around, the learning around that is going to change. The research can be updated online. It will always be up to date. The kind of basic print book could be enduring, and persistent, and kind of relatively unchanging for a few years. You know, so it's, it's it, we change the model of textbooks. It's one way to think about 
We need more scenarios. So if you have scenarios to throw at us. I'm not sure about ideas, but the whole thing is intended to be quite open. The follow-up for me would be we're creating an online space like like everybody in a true pal system where we're hoping that everybody who <coughs> wants to stay in touch with us at least will just uh, we'll get back in touch with you and you can track the progression of this if you want to contribute. It's an open effort that's led out of OCAD. Uh, we're reaching out to publishers, designers, uh, librarians, and booksellers. Uh, so, and, and, and obviously we're all readers. Um, so if you, if you want to get involved, we'd love to have more of your input. And we're hoping to launch before the end of June a new site that will allow you to track this project and, and participate. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to make the invitation to anybody that if you're, if you're authors or technologists and developers and you're working with any of the ideas or technologies that have been mentioned here, those would be, we would be interested in not, not just in collaboration, but pointers to the things that you're working with. I mean, maybe the collaboration will happen several years down the road. This may not be immediate problems. This is kind of a long-term vision. It'd be great to have people immediately, but keep us in mind, if you're working on something that also may be a, a year or two down the road, you know, look for us, tell us what you're working on, you know, write it down and let's stay in touch uh, on this because this is a, this is a long range kind of project. Where, Mark, where can we find you? Okay, that's the call. Oh, Here. Yeah, yeah, right. I, I put up my email. I'll share it with Peter and, and Greg and Carlos. So if you have any ideas or any thoughts, that says logan at physics.utoronto.ca. I am a lapsed physics professor. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to be an artist, designer. Uh, I want to thank. Uh, for a, I don't get my last word. Okay, first, for one, uh, if you don't want to email, but you want to look at a web page, flab.ocad.ca. Okay. Uh, I apologize if I was a tyrannical facilitator. But the whole idea was to make sure everybody got a chance to say something and contribute, and you did. And I thank you very much for having done that. Now comes the best part of the session, which is the end. We have 10 minutes for the next session, and we can mingle and talk to each other on an individual basis. And God bless you. Office Mozilla and Linux, at least how those things are monetized and how they, and how they get paid. In the case of Open Office, uh, most of the top core developers are still being paid by Sun, because Sun makes a commercial version of Open Office called Star Office, and they have been selling that. That makes them money. They use that to fund people at the top of this Open Office development team. In the case of Mozilla, they actually have found a nonprofit foundation that funds them. They take donations, they get lots of donations, they have some very nice benefactors and companies such as Google, which pays Mozilla in order to be the top search engine within the Mozilla window. So when you download Mozilla, the default search engine there is Google, and Google pays Mozilla for that privilege. Uh, and that then in turn is used to pay some of its top developers. In the same way, uh, Linux has, I'd say most of its top developers are on the payroll of companies like IBM, HP, Novell, and Red Hat. So because Red Hat's making money selling Linux, as is IBM, as is HP, they all have a stake in Linux being good. And so what they all do is they all hire a handful of programmers who are part of the team. So they might not retain it. They're available for all kinds of problems, not just product development at all kinds of well, they're there for product development, but at that point now that HP and IBM and Novell have paid these guys, then they go off into a corner and they decide their priorities. IBM and HP do not control how they, the direction they take Linux, because right now they're entrusted that these guys have already done the right thing. So you would actually, as a developer, you, you, you take a cut and pay and have that kind of power for you. I mean, that's, that's got to be quite an there, Well, some, there's some people that do. Now, for the echelon below that, for the people that are above the top core, what happens very often is that bounties will be paid. Mm -hmm. Fix this problem, and there's a thousand bucks in fixing this problem. We've identified this. First person to come up with the fix gets this particular bounty. And in fact, there's a number of open source projects that use this bounty system 
Uh, they have a sponsor that says, well, I'm not going to pay the entire project, but I have this one particular thing that needs to get fixed. I'm going to give $1,000 to the first person that can do it. Or if nobody takes them up on the $1,000, it's too complex, well, then they have the end. Yes. How would domestic rights or print products come to play, or, or when you go out and say an originating publisher, that, that sort of parceling out in region law sort of thing, especially seeing as part of when I purchased the, the print rights, it's often the, the electronic rights as well for, for my country. Right. And I'm wondering how, if you thought, obviously, if it's open source, on the, available for everybody internationally, what then happens in terms of that ability to kind of hide off stuff for different countries? That is probably going to be one of the legal concepts that is most at risk yeah. from the online proliferation of content. The music industry has already had to deal with it. Uh, the movie industry has had to deal with it, that whole region coding thing of DVDs. Uh, more and more people are figuring out how to work around it. They're just downloading region-free videos and things like that. So you're finding the consumers are finding a way around that in other fields already. So the, e the answer to that is that there is no easy answer. And uh, locking things like the region codes on DVDs have not worked. Uh, the idea of saying, uh, I want to release the Charlie Chaplin DVD for half the price in Europe that it is here, uh, won't cut it yeah. because, of the, because of the mobility of the stuff over the internet. Uh, you can't put up those walls. And you essentially have to deal at an international level with, with that reality now. And outside of the fact that you can have language, you can possibly do language rights a lot easier than you can do country rights. Yeah. I really can't see in the long term how you're going to be able to enforce uh, territorial rights in, in the electronic world. And does anyone else have any well, ideas? That's based on the value of what we are doing. These other bloggers are starting to cross the road. And the thing that really that we've all noticed is missing from the whole equation so far is we, we hear, we get great feedback from the publicists and the publishers all the time. Oh, thanks, I want you to really hear your review. Um, and they'll send us links to, or contact information for the book publishers or the, uh, the author to do an interview. Um, but rarely will they send us, send people to the site from their own site or from their Twitter account or Facebook or whatever to say, if you love kids' books, you have to check out this lots of possible things before breakfast. They have a great profile on data strength. So help promote the community by helping to promote the books in general. Is there anything else? Thank you very, very much for being here.
phenomenal. So you guys, round of applause for you guys. You were and so Connie Crosby put me in touch with uh, Judy Dunn at the iSchool here. Um, and I must say, I was a bit worried with the different floors and we didn't know how many people were coming. I thought it was a wonderful place to do this and very appropriate to have the library school host an event like this. And uh, so I would like to uh, call Judy up here to take a bow. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you.